That's a sync for the little cameras. Cadillac ELR, more than just a fancy Volt. Apps for driving, we run down five of the best. And tech that works and doesn't at keeping your dog safe in the car. It's time to check the tech. We see cars differently. Nice. We love them on the road and under the hood, but also check the tech and are known for telling it like it is. Ugly is included at no extra cost. The good, the bad, the bottom line. This is CNET on Cars. Welcome to CNET on Cars, the show all about high-tech cars and modern driving. I'm Brian Cooley. Well, if you love the idea of a Chevy Volt, but want a little better looks, more performance, and increased cachet, Cadillac would seem to have you covered with this, the ELR. But is it too derivative of the Chevy? Let's find out as we drive this first year model and check the tech. Ah yes, the high-tech running gear of the Chevy Bolt with the style and technology of a Cadillac. But is it really the peanut butter and chocolate experience they promise? Or more like peanut butter and caviar? Yeah. So what is an ELR? Well, it's a compact car, same class as a Honda Civic or a VW Golf. And while it is a sibling to the Chevy Volt, it's actually 11 inches longer, although you wouldn't know it judging by this stubby nose under that aluminum hood. The rest of the car seems to be a shrunken down CTS coupe. Uh, overall, the presentation's a little too much like a little bronzed baby shoe. Do they still do that? First off, the cabin of this ELR fits its top of the line image. Very futuristic. They've really sleeked out the Cadillac look. And of course, no mechanical gauges anywhere in the car. Also, notice what else is missing? Look around for a second. Not a knob in the entire vehicle. Everything is either touch sensitive or some kind of a very nicely done button here on the wheel. You've got a couple of rotators here on the stalk, but this is a very future interface. Which can be good or bad. Sometimes you just don't want to fiddle with this touch thing over here to do the volume. It's also got haptic feedback, and I think car makers are learning that there is a place for mechanical controls. Now here on the head unit, you've got kind of everything in the home screen. Navigation, in this car it's real nav, not just the OnStar nav. Audio system, you've got every possible source you want in there. Phone with Bluetooth streaming, of course. Pandora sits all by itself over here, not under audio, which then goes under radio and other sources, so they still got this a little bit scattered. Here's where things get a little bit tech for tech's sake, though, and it's a theme we're going to see around the cabin. Now, there's the radio. I just went to it, and I'm seeing it with all of its full information. Now, give it a second. Now, you see it winks out to a minimized display and doesn't come back until I go to reach it, and the proximity sensor brings it up. Very cool. Very stupid. What's the point? Why don't I want this up all the time? When it strips down to less, it doesn't get me anywhere. It just shows they could do it. What I really want is a real back button, an actual button, not one of these constantly moving variations of back and exit buttons that show up in different places on the touchscreen. As you may have noticed in there, you've got pause play radio so you can hold things when you're got to be distracted and then get back to your favorite broadcast. Now, tech for tech's sake continues here. Here's your door over the cup holders, which normally would be one of these things that's kind of spring actuated. But here, it's like a DVD player tray. It's actually got a motor, but it's not very elegant the way you use it. You got to kind of burp it to start, and then it continues the rest. That doesn't necessarily make the experience any better. It just shows that Jules Verne still works at GM. Ditto for the glove box door. I don't need a button over here to operate a servo to open the glove box, which also when my hand goes to that button. Reproximity senses the radio for no reason. Things are a little better on the instrument panel over here. On the left side, you see your battery charge indicator. On the right is your gasoline level indicator. And then you've got four different instrument panels you can choose from. You've got classic, modern, classic enhanced, and modern enhanced. I'm not sure I need four, but they are meaningfully different. Maybe split those two across too. You get a lot of good information in there about the vehicle, how you're driving. It's good coaching. I especially like that gauge on the left. It shows you how you're accelerating, but also how you're braking. It's a key tool to teach you momentum conservation, which is really important to gain the most out of your car's energy source, whatever it is. Now, in light of all this futuristic dash, it's kind of surprising to see a very traditional looking PRNDL automatic style drive selector, really more than 
than a transmission control. Rear view camera is of course standard. It just gives you trajectory. It doesn't have any multi views. There's no forward cam. There's no around cam. And then underneath the mode control is your whole driving personality. You start off in tour, which is your basic comfort mode. Sport's going to make the accelerator, steering, and suspension more aggressive. And then Mountain is going to make a more aggressive recharge profile because it knows you're going to be going up a grade quite a bit. Finally, you've got paddles on the wheel. What these guys do is do adaptive on-demand regeneration. So when you pull on one of these, you go into heavy regen. It drags the car back, kind of like compression braking in a combustion engine. But in this case, it's more aggressively using the regen of the motor-engine combo to charge the battery more and allows you to put some drag on the car. It's either great if you're going down a hill or if you want to do some cornering and use this as kind of your braking to turn in. It can be used different ways. I don't think many drivers are going to think about it that way. Now under the stubby aluminum hood, you've got basically a hotted up Volt Voltec power system here. This is a 1.4 liter lean burn gas engine, which is basically there to drive a generator to juice up the big old battery that will then drive a 55 kilowatt traction motor that really moves the car. Front wheel drive, no all wheel drive option on this guy. We're looking at numbers that are 181 total horsepower, 295 foot pounds of torque. Remember, it's electric, very torquey thing by its nature. The whole machine weighs 4,050 pounds, 0 to 60 in 7.9 respectable seconds. Now some fuel economy numbers. It gets a little odd here. 82 MPGE when you're running in electric mode and you've got 37 miles of pure electric range on a full charge, by the way. And then you get 3135 MPG when you're running with the gas engine fired, generating juice as it goes to run the electric motor. It's a dual mode situation on these range extenders. Your total range, gas and electric combined, is 300. 145 miles. And charging's funny on these cars. It's four to five hours for a full charge from flat on a level two 240 volt charger. But remember, this isn't strictly a battery electric car. As long as you have gas, it'll make electricity and run itself. So it doesn't have range anxiety. Now the first thing I noticed in the ELR is the most atrocious brake pedal feel I've ever driven. It kind of comes on in two stages that are both kind of hard to modulate smoothly. The first one is just operating regen, it feels like. And then as you push further, then the service brakes kick in, but they kind of kick in like that, like they go over a notch. I mean, really awful. But after that, you start to get absorbed in the really smooth and quiet ride quality in this thing. They've really smoothed it out. And it doesn't hurt that you've got 435 pounds of a T-shaped battery underneath me, kind of going this way and then spreading across the back. Does wonders for keeping a car planted and very, uh, very solid and fighting back against road vibration. But then all that beautiful smoothness is shattered once you use up the battery like I just have and the engine kicks in and it actually vibrates the brake pedal and the steering wheel. I'm kind of shocked by that. So in electric mode, great smooth ultra luxury car with a very good job managing engine whine and gear gnash. Not every electric car has that figured out, but man, when that little generator engine kicks in, it's a different vehicle. Now my other gripe is it just doesn't feel that fast. I mean, on paper, it's two seconds faster than a Nissan Leaf. It just doesn't feel like it to me for some reason. I've, I've run it through tour and sport mode and there's never a crisp sort of a get up and go from the electric power that I've come to know in so many EVs. It's definitely, what would I say, sprightly, but that nice sharp kick in, I guess it's there. I don't know. I wasn't impressed by that. Cornering, of course, is pretty darn good because you got all this weight well over two tons and it sits low and well spread across the underside. And of course, the back seat room is is kind of a nothing. I mean, you you can't sit behind me when I'm in this car. There is no way. There's just, you know, what, a couple of inches of legroom back there. This is the less practical sister of the Chevy Volt. Okay, let's price our ELR. I'd like you to sit down for this part. $76,000 base. That's a problem. But we're not done. To get it CNET style, you gotta spend 1700 bucks for the luxury package. That gets you 20s, intelligent headlights, and the blind spot and cross traffic tech. And then an adaptive cruise control package is nearly $2,000 more. All in, we're right up against $80,000 before federal and state tax credits that could easily be 10 grand. Let's keep that in mind. Still, we're looking at a $70,000 very small Cadillac with two doors and silly back seats that isn't that much different a performer than a Chevy Volt and can't hold a candle to a Tesla Model S, which is thousands less. Cadillac's doing a lot of great cars these days. 
I'm afraid this just isn't one of them, largely based on its price. Check out our full review on this Cadillac ELR at cars.cnet.com. Well, do you have a dog? And do you take your dog in the car with you? Most dog owners I knew do from time to time. But is he or she safe when you do that? The technology and the techniques to make sure are of great interest to the smarter and the humane driver. Now the first thing to know about getting your dog or cat ready to go in the car, come on Duncan, here we go, is not to do it all of a sudden on the day when you have to, to go to the vet or take a trip somewhere. You gotta ease them into this whole idea. They don't know what this is. Get them used to going in the car in stages. First, by not going anywhere at all. Get your pet in the car in front of the house. Then, short little drives around the neighborhood, rewarded with treats, of course. Have blankets and beds in the car that they are used to, that came out of the house. I recognize the smell. And then later, when it really matters, they're not freaked out. Remember, animals get used to things they don't understand, like cars, by recognizing patterns that don't threaten them over time. So you've got to give them time to get used to this machine. Oh, there's a good boy. Now, once you do get your pet used to going around in the car, here's why it's important to secure them in there. Our 60-pound friend here weighs 2,700 pounds when a car comes to a dead stop from as little as 35 miles per hour. That inertia can be very damaging to him, to you, and then you've got a freaked out animal in the car after an accident who, if he's loose, can be threatening first responders or running out into traffic, getting himself hurt or causing another accident. And I'm sure you've seen these sort of barricades that are used in wagons and SUVs, and they're fine for compartmentalizing the vehicle, but does this look like it's up to the task of handling 2,700 pounds of flying dog? No. And that's where these safety harnesses come in. They've got this whole padded sort of chest piece here, and then it lashes over the back of their neck and underneath the front legs. Kind of goes on like this. And this whole thing clips to a sliding tether that goes onto the shoulder belt portion in the second row, away from those front row airbags. Dogs should always be restrained in vehicles, even if you're just going on a short journey. But here's the problem. A recent study done by the Center for Pet Safety, in conjunction with Subaru, because their owners love to bring their dogs around in their cars, found that a lot of these harnesses are crap. They gathered 11 of them in a recent survey. One of them tested really well. Six of them basically broke on impact, didn't work out well at all. Four of them were so bad they didn't even bother testing them. One with the unlikely name of Sleepy Pod Click It was the only one that held up well in this study. It happens to be among the priciest as well, at 90 to 100 bucks, but seemingly money well spent. Now, when it comes to cats, it's kind of like Harry and Tonto. Uh, my cat has to relieve himself. You're not supposed to have any animals on a vehicle. Always in a carrier on the road. And then what you want to do is use the belts to at least lash this carrier in place. Again, second row away from front row airbags. You might also consider putting it down in the well between the two rows of seats. That really kind of locks it in. And some cats love being in little enclosed areas. And look for a carrier that's got places for the belt to sort of snug in so it doesn't just slip off like this. Now let's talk about dogs in the backs of pickup trucks. A few states and a few additional municipalities have laws against it. Most do not. The Marin Humane Society was actually at the forefront of introducing legislation to ban that. Uh, there's dangers with dogs uh, possibly flying out of vehicles if you get into a collision or if you have to stop short. And we introduced that way back in 1983. It, eventually, a couple decades later, it became a state law in California. Here's what you want to do to use common sense. Get your dog into a carrier, a rigid carrier in the bed. Then cross tether that so it's not sliding around fore and aft, left to right in any kind of maneuver or impact. If that's not a possibility, then Investing in some kind of harness would be another option. And of course, it should go without saying, park the car, take the pet. Like it's incredibly hot in a car on even a slightly warm day. If you're stopping even just for an errand, don't keep them in the car without any ventilation. Keeping your pet safe in the car, it pays humane dividends to double check that you've done it right. Coming up, Parallel parking made easy by technique and technology when CNET on Cars rolls on.
The Audi Q3 launched in 2011 and is Audi's smallest ever SUV. It's essentially an A3 with some taller springs and a bit more presence. That RS badge means it's got something special about it. It means it's the ultimate version of the Q3, the best it can possibly be. The people that buy these small premium SUVs are looking for something that's a cut above, something that makes them feel special. They've got to be easy to drive and easy to enjoy. They've got to be idiot proof. Find more from the XCAR team of CNET UK at CNET.com slash XCAR. Welcome back to CNET on Cars, coming to you from our home at the Marin Clubhouse of Cars Duidiac, just north of the Golden Gate Bridge. Well, parallel parking, or your inability to do it, remains a source of abject shame for a fair number of drivers. Witness the number of parking assistance technologies that have been invented as evidence of that. So today we bring you a double header how-to. One is a foolproof technique to parallel park easily every time. The other is how to pick the right parking technology in case you never get it. Now the method I'm gonna show you I like because it's got lots of specific numbers and commands that are easy to remember if parallel parking spooks you. First of all is find your spot. The magic number here is five. You need about five feet more in the space than the length of your car. A compact car like this Mazda 3 is about 15 feet long, so you need about 20 feet of space. Pull up alongside the car ahead of you with about two to three feet of space in between you. Now you want to back up, and here's the most critical area, until the back of that car is lined up with about the bottom of your back seats. This will vary a bit on cars because they all have different wheelbase, overhang, and seating position. This is the key thing you want to learn about your car, but it's about a third of it overhanging that car. Now, go all the way full lock on your wheel aiming into the space so you get 45 degrees in the street. Just look right out and see it. At this point, as you're rolling, go all the way to full opposite lock and the car should glide right in. If you've got a backup camera, that certainly helps. And then just do one forward nibble to bring in the nose and center up your space. And you're in. It's a pretty reliable method without having to do a lot of fuzzy stuff. The steps are real clear. Now, after all this, parking is a skill you may soon barely need. Automatic parking tech has been coming for a while. The first system I drove was in a 2007 Lexus LS. This car will park itself, Lexus Park Assist. It took care of the hard part, steering while you handled the pedals. Back then it was cumbersome, tentative, and you could have made three attempts in the time it took to make one. Flash forward a few years to the Ford system we showed you in a recent CarTech 101 that still just handled the steering, but now did it really quickly and well. The 2015 Ford Focus will also do this trick for perpendicular spaces and will be able to automatically exit a parking spot, which I didn't realize was difficult. And they have joined Volvo and Audi among the companies that are moving soon to the ultimate step. Cars that park without you even being in them and perhaps even able to drop you off and then go park on their own one day soon, even in spots too narrow for you to open the doors once the car's there. All these technologies, however, must be built into a new car. So until you're in the market, use the steps we taught you. In a moment, the hidden code reader and driving apps you need on your phone when CNET on Cars continues. The Golf GTI doesn't have a billion horsepower and it doesn't have a look that will turn every head on the high street, but it's still special. In this spec you get 220 horsepower, 258 pound foot, a 151 mile an hour top speed and a 0-62 time of 6.5 seconds, so it's fast. Find more from the XCAR team of CNET UK at CNET.com slash XCAR. Welcome back to CNET on Cars. I'm Brian Cooley. 
Time for a piece of your email. This comes in from Ben G this time, who was watching a top five I did recently of really simple technologies I think every car should have built in. One of them was an OBD2 code reader. And he says, hey, wait a minute. In my 99 Cadillac Seville, there is one built in. I didn't know that. Looked into it, he's absolutely right. You push certain buttons on the dash, and it'll pull up the code and also explain, very simply, what that code means. So you don't need to go buy a reader and plug it in. Uh, it seems to have vanished after the 2003 model year, as far as I can tell. And I imagine it wasn't a huge hit with the dealers, because they make a ton of money, as you know, off their service bays. And being able to have the car tell you its codes and decode them is one less reason to drop by the dealer for a little service consultation. Maybe that's why it's gone. Who knows? You know, not many technologies have been so disruptive, as they say, in the car as smartphone apps. Apps for driving that bring us information and services you literally could not have imagined behind the wheel seven or eight years ago. Here's my top five. Use them safely. And we're not covering music apps because I bet you got that one staked out already. Also not covering telematics apps like OnStar, that sort of thing, because they're so specific to the particular car you own. Let's go. Number five, performance apps. Now I put these at five because let's face it, most folks don't give a rat's ass how many G's they're pulling. But if you do, these apps are cool. You typically pair one with an OBD2 dongle that plugs into your car's data port and merges the vehicle's data with time and GPS location and unlocks an unseen world of motoring. We use one of these for CNET on cars shoots to merge the car's telemetry with video out the windshield. Even using one without an OBD2 dongle, your phone's built-in accelerometer can do a lot to coach you to drive more efficiently or more precisely. Others function as GPS speedometer and odometer combos, and some even have a mode to become a sort of poor man's head-up display. This is truly a great category for the car geek. Number four, gas apps. I rank these low-ish because I think most of us just buy gas when it's handy when the light comes on. But if you're the Ben Franklin type, these are great for finding cheap fuel and tracking the real fuel economy of your car. Won't you be surprised when it's different than what the car's computer says? These are also great for quickly finding the nearest gas station when your car doesn't have built-in navigation. Number three are parking apps. One of the great driving frustrations in 2014 remains what to do with your car when you get there. Here we are still driving around and around the block in a combination of childlike faith and pagan ritual, hoping to find a spot. Parking apps can reveal municipal data on where spots are located, say in garages, as well as what the cost is to use them. Crowdsourced apps can let people share information about spots that they are leaving so someone else can come get it. And don't forget the other apps that let you actually pay for your parking and renew it without having to run back to the meter all the time with coins or a car. Use one of these and then go rediscover your childhood some other way. Number two, navigation and mapping apps. Duh, being able to live search for what you need, tell that app to navigate you to the result, or take you to the address of what's coming up in your calendar, then fold in live traffic conditions and best route information that can include crowdsourcing, or even use one of these to find a great scenic drive when you're not in a hurry, and run all of this with great voice command, all better on your $200 phone than on your car's $2,000 nav rig. But not more safely, which we'll tackle with number one in a moment. Before I get to number one, I'll tell you what it won't be to some of your howls of objection and that is speed apps. I know these are popular, calling out speed traps and even alcohol checkpoints, but there's something unseemly about apps that are meant to circumvent the enforcement of laws that work best when you don't know where Smokey is. So I'm kind of leaving these out. The number one kind of app for really any kind of driver, I think is a car mode app. This functions with whatever you're using your phone for and turns your phone into less of a disaster waiting to happen behind the wheel. The idea is to put the car relevant stuff on the screen behind big buttons and then bury the 99% of apps you shouldn't be using while driving, while rolling in easy access to voice command and bonus points for a few of these that combine a slick head up display mode to keep your eyes out the windshield. Customizable buttons help you make it yours. Combine it with a good windshield mount, not one of those crappy ones you get for seven bucks at the car wash, and you've got a great infotainment system in the car.
Hey, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed this episode. Send me your thoughts on what you want us to cover. It's a big part of what we do around here on cars at CNET.com. If you want to know what's going on behind the scenes each week or see the cars we're shooting, follow me on Twitter, Brian Cooley, Facebook.com slash AskCNET, or catch me or on cars on G+. I'll see you next time we check the tech. I need one more take.